It's a great pleasure to welcome you to uh, this inaugural lecture to be delivered by my fellow cyclist and Professor of International Development, uh, Fiona Noonan. Um, I have a few things to say about Fiona before we start. Um, Fiona was born and grew up in Swindon, the middle child of Maureen and Frank. Um, Maureen is with us tonight, Fiona's mum, welcome. Um, and one of five girls, and I think the other four are also yeah. here, so welcome to all of you. Um, she attended St. Joseph's Comprehensive School, studying uh, A-levels at Swindon College, and there went to study chemistry uh, with management science at the University of Kent. Uh, but she realised well before the end of her three-year study that life in a laboratory was not for her, um, and neither was chemistry. It took a couple of years to work out what to do next, and in 1992, following a couple of visits to India, including a month with the New Hope Rural Leprosy Trust, uh, she started a master's degree in Environment, Development and Policy at the University of Sussex, and I can vouch for that degree, having um, taught on it and uh, run it for several years myself, uh, although sadly a few years after uh, Fiona graduated. Um, Looking for work after her MA degree, Fiona applied for a position at the University of Birmingham as a research associate to work on a project valuing the environmental impacts of landfill waste in Bangkok. And she was fortunate to secure the position and joined what was then the Development Administration Group in the School of Public Policy, two things that no longer exist. Oh, we do. Well, you kind of do. We do, definitely. But not with those <laughs> names. <laughs> So credit yeah. goes to Donald Curtis, former yeah, director of IDD, here. who is that's here. Welcome, good, yeah. Donald. Um, and the project lead, Ian Bloor. Is he's he? not here, no. Ian's not yeah, here, but yeah. anyway, for believing in Fiona. <laughs> on her first day at work, Fiona was <laughs> advised to embark on a PhD. That, that was how it went then, something she had never considered before. She did this working on her PhD under the super supervision of Andrew Colson of the Institute Over for here. Local <laughs> Government Studies. Andrew is here. Welcome, Andrew. Um, <laughs> Uh, for a study on environmental policy making, uh, which she did on a part-time basis. And when she completed the Bangkok research, she moved on to a series of research projects funded by the Department of International Development's National Resor Natural Resources Systems Program on natural resource management and livelihoods at the rural urban interface in India and Ghana. Uh, this meant that Fiona stayed on in DAG, uh, which became IDD in 1997, and she was offered a permanent lectureship on gaining her PhD in 1998. Then things changed a bit. By 2002, she felt she wanted to try out something new and spend some time in a low-income country. So she secured a job as the Institutional and Social Development Advisor for a DFID-funded project, uh, Integrated Lake Management in Uganda, working for Care International. And with her husband, Trevor, who's also here at the back somewhere, welcome, Trevor, um, and their two young children, Amy, who's here, and Not Eloise, so who yet. should be watching online. Um, she uh, moved to Kampala in January 2003 and moved into the area of fisheries management and development. She worked on a second project in the region on Lake Victoria, working with the Lake Victoria Fisheries Organization and living opposite the shores of the lake in the small town of Jinja, uh, which sounds to me uh, quite idyllic. Um, and traveling extensively with, within Kenya, Tanzania, and Uganda. And she also helped Trevor with setting up and running a small international school and set up a dance school <laughs> with weekly classes in ballet and jazz. Um, Just had to get that it there. would be brilliant if we have some <laughs> ballet and jazz tonight. Uh, <laughs> no, maybe not. I suspect that might not happen. No. In 2008, uh, wanting to come back to the UK, Fiona came across an advert for a lectureship in IDD. Uh, to cover research leave for one year, and she hadn't been forgotten and was pleased to be appointed returning to academia and to the university. She's been with us ever since, uh, drawing on her experience in Uganda and has focused her research on, on how natural resources are governed and the challenges experienced in their governance, which is also the subject of tonight's lecture. In 2014, in January 2014, Fiona became the first woman to take on the role of the head of department of IDD. I, I'm afraid that's actually quite shocking. But yeah. anyway, it's good that you <laughs> did that. Um, and she served two terms, um, standing down from the position only in December 2019. 
Fiona has a strong commitment to the principles, practice and purpose of international development and so has been very involved, uh, for example, particularly with the UK's Development Studies Association, which is actually where I first came across Fiona, um, serving on its governing council for six years and leading a study group for researchers working on the broad area of environment, natural resources and climate change. Fiona says that she doesn't have a lot of spare time, uh, but she does spend her spare time cooking and coping with the voluminous produce from Trevor's allotments, <laughs> as well as walking the family dog, Alfie, who I presume is not here, but well, would, but would actually very be very welcome. Um, so with that, that's enough from me. We all want to hear from Fiona. So uh, please welcome Fiona. Thank you. Right. Um, thank you very much, uh, Richard, for those uh, kind words. And thank you all for uh, coming this evening. It's great to see such a fantastic turnout. Um, there are seats um, for anyone who is sitting on the stairs, but uh, not that I want to organise anyone <laughs> too much. Uh, I want to say a few words uh, before I get into the substance of my lecture this evening about an inaugural lecture. Now, it's a bit of a tradition uh, for people who are promoted to the uh, title of professor to give an inaugural lecture. But as you can imagine, it's quite a daunting prospect um, and not helped by the number of people who have wished me luck <laughs> over the last few days. So whilst I greatly appreciate that, I just sort of feel as though it's piling on the pressure. And um, it's a bit of a daunting task because um, you're trying to cater to a wide audience, um, you want your lecture to be understandable, interesting, engaging, but also to give the impression to your colleagues that you're cutting edge, that you've really made a great contribution. So there's a lot hanging on this, right? <laughs> but I can assure you that there are no evaluation forms tonight. Uh, there are no, there's no time for questions either, but you can catch me in the wine reception, which hasn't been mentioned yet. So I'm just going to keep promoting that. Okay, so it is a, a daunting occasion and people approach their inaugural lectures in very different ways. Um, so I, I think um, the way that I've approached it then is that I want to, um, as, as Richard has explained, that I want to um, cover and explain to you what I've been doing in my academic career and try to answer the question that I've set for the lecture. So I also see an inaugural lecture as a great opportunity not only to celebrate the, the fact of my promotion, but also to, as an opportunity to share with you what I've been working on and hopefully share some of the passion that I feel about this subject. So against all university regulations on fire risk, uh, the doors are locked, you can't escape. <laughs> and so you will um, come to know uh, a bit more about natural resource governance than perhaps you thought you ever needed to know. Um, so what I've, I've tried to do in this lecture then is um, try to sort of build a, a, a narrative, an explanation about you know, just how these elusive win-win outcomes can be achieved, drawing on my own research and experience um, in, the, in practice, but also on the work of others. So um, I try to sort of build a story, hopefully, that will be understandable, engaging and uh, answer, go some way maybe towards answering that question. Um, the other reason for um, giving this talk that title is because this challenge or this dilemma of how and whether you can achieve both development outcomes, whether you see development in terms of uh, economic growth, improved income, improved livelihoods, well-being, and, and um, uh, environmental improvements is actually at the core of uh, environment and development research and practice is that constant dilemma comes up time and time again and if you study this um, area and you work in this area you'll see that constant dilemma and we'll see that coming up again uh, during this evening's talk okay so that's what i'm going to cover and i hopefully by the end of it I'm going to say an awful, well, I'm, unfortunately, I'm going to say a lot of reasons why it's, it's so difficult to achieve this, but you'll hopefully be convinced that we should remain optimistic and how we can do that uh, by the end of it. OK, so as um, Richard said, I am starting a little bit <coughs> at uh, how I came into this uh, subject of uh, environment and development. And the year was, as Richard said, was 1992. 
the year that I embarked on environment and international development by doing that MA degree. But 1992 was also a really important year for um, thinking and action on the environment and development, as I'm sure in particular students in my environment and sustainable development class will know, but I maybe won't embarrass them right now. <laughs> so the year was 1992, and it was the year of the United Nations Conference on Environment and Development, held in Rio de Janeiro. Um, an awful lot of uh, government heads um, attended this conference. It was the first really major conference that brought environment and development thinking and action together. And it was particularly important because it was where the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change was agreed and it kick-started the negotiations on climate change. Now, now, you must remember, this is 1992, pre the internet, no social media. How did I come to know about this conference when I was, at the time, working uh, in a temporary job? But I won't maybe say what I was doing. Okay, so I came across this book. So just in case, on the off chance, that Jonathan Porritt, uh, the journalist, environmentalist, is watching or comes across this recording, um, it's thanks to him, I think at least in part, um, that I came across uh, this book, Save the Earth, which was all about the United Nations Conference on Environment and Development, the Agenda 21, that some of you will be familiar with. And I felt inspired by that. And although I didn't know what I was going to do after the master's degree, certainly didn't plan on an academic career, I thought that sounds really interesting. It brings together my environmental interests, my interests in um, developing countries and development. So I'll, I'll go and try that and I'll see what happens next. So Save the Earth really saved me, I think. Um, now, I just wanted to, this, I've, I've flung this um, slide in at the last minute, just in case you're interested to know what, just what was all this thinking about the environment and development at that time in the 60s, 70s, 80s and 90s. Well, BBC Radio 4 um, have been very kindly putting on a series of uh, programmes over the last few weeks. It's still going on at the moment, 1.45 every day, just 15 minutes. You can uh, go on to their website and uh, uh, catch up with those. And a series of um, programmes about green originals, about the thinkers, the early thinkers uh, around the environment. So I'd strongly recommend that to you. Very short programmes and you can uh, learn a bit more about what was going, what were the issues of the day, what were the debates and what were the, those uh, key thinkers saying. And uh, one area those key thinkers were particularly sort of feeding into is, as I said, is this debate about whether you can uh, improve the environment, protect the environment and deliver on developmental outcomes at the same time. Because for many low income countries, whilst they welcomed this kind of international agreement, this international dialogue on the environment and development, they felt that um, this was potentially a threat to their development, that more barriers to economic development would be created by these international environmental agreements. And so in the 1980s, a report uh, was commissioned, uh, by, and it was a, a commission was formed, the World Commission on Environment and Development, led by Gro Harlem Brundtland. And they produced this report in 1987. It's often referred to as a Brundtland report um, after Gro Harlem Brundtland, but it's actually called Our Common Future. And this report has been very influential in this whole area of environment and development. And as many of you, I'm sure, will know, it's particularly famous for coining the term and defining sustainable development. And sustainable development, this idea of sustainable development, was really fundamental and, and created new thinking at that time because it stated that you could have economic development and protect the environment at the same time. But that had to be done with fairness and equity to current generations and future generations. So that was the first thing that was really important about that report. The second area that I want to flag this evening was the way that it thought about the relationship between environmental protection and uh, poverty. So you, as you can see from this quote, what this report said was that many parts of the world are caught in a vicious downward spiral. It suggested that poor people are forced to overuse the environment to survive from day to day, 
and that their impoverishment of their environment further impoverishes them, making their survival ever more difficult and uncertain. So this gives a very sort of um, bleak um, impression of uh, the relationship between poverty and the environment. <laughs> and it's often also shown as a vicious circle. So this vicious circle thinking has been quite influential in environmental um, dialogue, in environmental policy. The thinking that, you know, if you're living in poverty, you have no choice but to degrade the environment. And that, that environmental degradation will lead to further poverty. And you can see this kind of thinking in some of the explanations for environmental degradation. So, for example, when it comes to deforestation, very often uh, the blame goes to smallholder farmers for clearing um, forest land, for agriculture, for grazing their cattle. But, of course, there could be many other factors at play, such as global demand for timber or perhaps illegal extraction supported by government ministers. Um, in the case of overfishing, that could very well often be blamed on small-scale fisher folk, whereas actually it could be um, governments um, allowing industrial fishers into uh, nearshore waters when they're not supposed to. So time and again, you can see that this um, influential portrayal of the relationship between poverty and the environment has influenced thinking, it's influenced narratives, and it's influenced explanations of environmental degradation. But I've never felt comfortable with this portrayal of the relationships between poverty and the environment. Um, not only because it's not true and that um, poverty doesn't necessarily lead to environmental degradation, but I, because I feel it detracts from the, the uh, role and influence of wealth and consumption, not just overconsumption, but the type of consumption in the global north in particular on environmental degradation. But that's not to say that there isn't some truth in that, um, that vicious cycle or circle, as we'll see as I go along. But um, just to say that um, it's, um, it's simplistic, it can be misleading, and I think it can be dangerous too. But one final thing I'd like to say about that portrayal before I move on is that you can look at it in two ways. So you could look at poverty causing in, uh, environmental degradation, and uh, environmental deg degradation causing po poverty, but you could also look at it much more positively in, in terms of improving or re relieving poverty, alleviating poverty, improving livelihoods, leading to an improved environment, an improved environment, improving people's lives. So you could look at it in that way as well. And that tends to be thought of then in terms of delivering on these win-wins where you get environmental improvement and an improvement in livelihoods, which I've rather crudely portrayed as a dollar sign there, so please forgive me any development people in the room. <laughs> um, or as trade-offs. So in trade-offs then, it, it suggests that you can't have both. You can't necessarily uh, achieve both environmental improvements and improvements in livelihoods. You're going to have to make a, a decision on who's going to lose out. You know, are you going to allow some over-extraction um, so that people's livelihoods can improve? Or are you going to shut people out of an area and not allow them to use the forests and therefore their livelihoods may um, get worse? So this win-win or trade-offs, again, a sort of a recurring theme in thinking about environment and development. Now, this um, aversion that I had to that uh, portrayal of uh, the vicious circle of poverty leading to environmental degradation, etc., led me over time to write a book that challenged that portrayal and suggested and put forward other ways of thinking about uh, that relationship to demonstrate and illustrate the complexity and the factors that affect um, that relationship between poverty and the environment. The sort of factors that mediate the relationship. That that so accepting that it's not necessarily a straightforward relationship, but there are many factors that influence the, whether it is a negative or positive relationship, etc. And so some of the key themes in that book are on this slide. So that, the, the book really emphasised the role of sort of power relationships. You know, who has power? Who has the power to make decisions? Who has the power to decide how 
resources are, are used, how they're managed, who, ac who accesses them and who benefits from them. Um, formal and informal rules. So whether it's um, government policies or local rules and social norms um, affect whether people benefit from the environment, whether they're able to access it, etc. And it also ref um, emphasizes the role of social relationships, who you talk to, who influences the way that you do things, and of course governance, which is the subject of uh, this lecture. So um, going back then to the vicious circle, we can see then that it's not necessarily this straightforward relationship, but you've got many factors influencing um, that relationship. Government policies and legislation, access to markets, whether at the local level, regional level, international, global, uh, there's all so sorts of power relationships and local rules and norms. And those can be, be beyond the natural resource. They don't have to be just about the natural resource. They could be about kinship. They could be gender norms. So how men and women interact differently with the environment and resources, etc. Household decision making, all sorts of local uh, rules, norms, um, influence and affect that poverty environment relationship. So having um, written that book, I've been preoccupied for many years about the relationship between poverty and the environment and my time um, in Uganda, five years working on fisheries management projects, led me to be, to be much more focused in my research in natural resource governance. So I thought I'd better offer a definition of uh, natural resource governance so we would just clear what I mean by that and how I sort of refer to it. Um, this definition is taken from the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, from their definition. Basically, then, it's, um, it's about who gets to make the decisions that count. Who is it and why are those particular actors? So natural resource governance, it's about how power and responsibilities over natural resources are exercised, how decisions are taken and how citizens um, secure access to participate in and are impacted by the management of natural resources. So it's different from natural resource management. It's much more about the decision making and the implications of that decision making. And it's about which stakeholders are involved and which stakeholders are not involved and why. So that's um, natural resource governance. Um, and, but before I want to I say too much more about natural resource governance, I just also want to emphasise just how important um, what I'm talking about is for, for the livelihoods of uh, many people living um, in low-income countries. So ultimately, all of us here tonight are dependent on the natural world. We're all dependent on nature for our, our food, water, the air that we breathe, etc., but for many people living particularly, particularly in rural areas in low-income countries, their dependence is much more direct and much, much stronger in the, and much more important. So um, the examples I've given here are the, number, the billions of people who rely on a daily basis for fuel wood, uh, for cooking and for um, cleaning um, water so it's ready for, for drinking for domestic purposes. And women and children in particular will spend hours every day collecting fuel as well as water. Um, similarly, in the case of fisheries, there are estimated that are just under 60 million people working in fisheries around the world. The FAO kindly provides these statistics. And it says that 85% of those people live in Asia, are in Asia, 10% in Africa, and 4% in Latin America and the Caribbean. So very few in the global north. So fisheries uh, represent a really important source of nutrition, uh, food security, employment, and income. So these, I'm just, actually, the other reason I'm emphasizing this is sometimes I think I'm seen as a bit niche in the department, but I'm, I can assure you, I'm not niche. <laughs> We're talking about millions of people dependent on these uh, natural resources. They'll be killing me later. Right. <laughs> so what does governance look like in practice then? I've given you a definition. Um, what does it look like in practice? Well, until about the 1980s, um, not necessarily since the beginning of time, but certainly over the sort of colonial period when um, 
many of the countries that I work in were colonised and nat many natural resources uh, were started to be governed much more centrally. The state took over. And so in the case of, uh, um, on this uh, right, this side next closer to me with that guard walking around the fence, um, national parks were created, wildlife, um, areas of land in particular were fenced off and local people were banned and uh, not allowed into certain areas. So areas where they may have grazed their cattle, they may have collected fuel wood, they may have accessed water, they were no longer able to access. Um, and as I say, management was much more centralised. Of course, before that time, there was um, much more local management in the form of customary authorities, uh, traditional rules and norms, etc. But um, as I say, over the colonial period, um, and in, right up into the 1980s, there was much more central government management and control of natural resources. Now, from the 1980s, that changed. And that changed, um, at least in part, because it was influenced by what was going on in, in um, the wider development initiative. So there's much more creation of local governments, much more decentralisation. And so the same thing happened within the natural resource sectors. There was decentralisation of um, government functions in uh, managing natural resources. And there was also, uh, similarly as, as in other sectors within uh, development, much more emphasis on participation of local people. Um, it was realised that you actually needed to get local people involved if uh, you're going to change their lives and if you're going to work with them and listen to them. And uh, handing over the stick, as Robert Chambers, uh, a renowned development scholar, would say. So um, this decentralisation, uh, this participation, led to what's broadly termed as community-based natural resource management. Um, and also collaborative forms of management. So either communities working themselves to manage the natural resources or working with government in various forms of collaboration. Now, this is really mainly what I'm going to be talking about for the rest of the talk about these community-based natural resource management and collaborative forms, which involve collaborations because they've been far from perfect. Although there was this shift, um, very often that shift was government-led or it was led by donors, uh, by NGOs, international projects, and so not necessarily initiated from the bottom up as might have been expected. However, there are some good examples of uh, community-based natural resource management that I'd like to, to share with you. Um, most commonly uh, referred to is uh, the example of community forests in Nepal. So there are about 18,000 uh, community forests registered there. Um, for community forest management has been going on since uh, the 1990s and um, generally seen as, as fairly successful, not completely perfect, but fairly successful. And about a third of the forest area in the country is now man under community forest management. Um, the other example I've got here is uh, in Namibia of community conservancies. So they're managing um, wildlife management areas, national parks, um, and they, um, they are the, particular, the reason why they've been particularly successful in Namibia is that the communities themselves have much more control of what happens to the revenue. They get revenue directly from tourists. Um, I, hesitate to mention trophy hunting I'm not going to say anything more about that tonight um, but um, and so they're able to have much more control <laughs> over what happens in their um, in their area and their conservancy and what happens to any revenue raised so there are some good examples <coughs> of um, natural resource management under these sorts of systems and of course there are so, still some systems of customary um, arrangements that still work very well in many countries. So a couple of examples I've given here. Um, in Ghana, as those of you who are familiar with Ghana will, will, will certainly know this, that there's very strong traditional systems and customary authority still in place. Uh, a well-known example um, in terms of natural resource management is this uh, hippo sanctuary that was set up uh, by a community that um, well, the government really wanted a reserve in this particular community um, to protect the hippo population there. 
Um, the community were not very happy about how the government wanted to go about that and so set up their own sanctuary that was founded on the chieftaincy system, the customary system that already existed. And of course within pastoralism there are many um, tribes and clans that they have their own rules, their own systems about when to move, where to move, um, how many livestock to keep and all kinds of decisions that they'll make um, themselves. Okay, just to... Um, to illustrate a little bit more then, I haven't included too, too many examples here, but as you can see that we're talking about these kinds of arrangements being all over the world. And in fact, um, it's estimated that about a third of the world's forests are managed under some sort of community forest uh, management system. But there are also many examples. I haven't got, I couldn't find any statistics uh, when it comes to fisheries. I've no idea how many community-based fisheries management systems there are. Maybe something I should be working on. And what these, these systems have in common then, and I've talked about them involving the community somehow, is that they very often form a sort of user group or a committee that are elected. They often have um, legal remit and um, they, you know, they have certain rules and regulations that come down from government. So over time, there's been a lot of research into um, how best we can support these groups or how they work really well. Um, and this slide tries to summarise some of the findings, uh, some of the factors that have been found to be important for these sort of arrangements to work well. Um, so first of all, law, having supportive um, legislation and policies in place that give legal remit and rights and power to these types of organisations. Um, so the sorts of organisation having local rules, local ownership, Often it seems to work better where you've got smaller populations and smaller resource areas, where you have conflict resolution systems in place, where there's a supportive government, where there's accountability systems in place so that the wider community know what's going on and they can hold the user group, uh, the elected members to account, and funding. Um, when these uh, systems were brought in in the 1980s, it was all, also a time where there was what was called structural adjustment happening and governments had to find ways to save money and one of the ways that they had to do that according to the world bank and other actors was to reduce the size of the government to reduce the size of the government offices so very often the government saw this formation of these sort of community organizations as a way of saving money and as a way of um, being able to manage these resources without investing into it but actually it's been found that it's not all that cheap. You do need to keep funding and supporting with technical advice and funding um, the system for them to keep going. So inevitably then, it's not been a completely rosy picture. Lots of problems have been experienced. And you might find it rather surprising that I've started off by uh, giving examples of uh, cases with problems by uh, listing one that I've been involved with. So I was involved uh, with uh, supporting the rollout, the building up of uh, fisheries co-management on Lake Victoria. And as uh, Richard mentioned, I travelled a lot around Kenya, Tanzania and Uganda because those three countries border the lake and they cooperate through the Lake Victoria Fisheries Organisation. And Lake Victoria is the second largest freshwater body in the world. It's a huge size. There are about 1,500 landing sites. So it's a huge operation to sort of roll out this kind of management um, scheme. So it's been quite a challenge to keep that going. And it hasn't, wasn't helped by the fact that the project that I worked on, well, firstly, co-management was only one small part of it. So I was constantly competing with other sectors um, for resources. But also it was a short term project and it didn't really have the resources and those resources haven't been realised after the project finished to support the ongoing um, co-management. And I will go on to some other problems that have been experienced a bit later. And even in the case of Namibia, you know, I cited Namibia as a, a good example of a co community conservancies. They've had, um, um, they have, has been found that there are examples of elite capture. Now, elite capture is something that's found in many examples of community-based natural resource management. And that basically refers to where people who have more power, who have more resources, greater wealth, are able to capture the gains of the decision-making power 
of these community-based structures. And that can be quite problematic for the types of the decisions are made, that are made and for the benefits of uh, certain people within the communities. It's not necessarily fair and it's not necessarily equitable. So lots of problems have been experienced. In terms of reactions then to these problems, given that we've, we, you know, we've, we admit, we've got all these problems um, with uh, these sort of collaborative and community-based approaches, well, some people have re responded to these problems by suggesting, well, maybe you can't achieve these win-win outcomes. Maybe you have to accept that there have to be trade-offs. And, um, and so in thinking about solutions, we have to decide you know, what sort of trade-offs will be made, what are politically acceptable, etc. Another response has been to suggest that we should go back to that centralised control, go back to fences and fines, and particularly within sort of thinking about protected areas and conservationists, particularly those concerned with uh, wildlife, um, so sometimes have been pushing this agenda. Um, you can see that in particularly the militarised responses to um, anti-poaching measures, etc. So there's a lot of pressure on these community-based approaches, on these collaborat uh, collaborative approaches to really prove that they're working. Otherwise, you know, there is a danger that that could be given up on and uh, excuses can be made to, for government to take over and uh, for communities to lose their influence. So I believe that uh, all is not lost and we shouldn't give up quite so easily. And so in um, 2016, 17, 18, I led a synthesis project funded by the Ecosystem Services for Poverty Alleviation Programme that tried to answer the question about how can governance deliver on improved environment and improved livelihoods? What do we know about governance that can enable that to happen? And that's summarised um, in this book chapter, uh, I strongly recommend this book to you, which is open access, so anyone can access it. Um, I've only got the one chapter in it, so I'm not going to win out too much but by promoting it, but it really is a fantastic collection from that research programme that was going on about nine years. Um, and the chapter, as I say in there, um, on uh, governing for ecosystem he health and human well-being, sort of summarises from the literature and from the experience of that research programme about what we know about how governance can better facilitate those win-win outcomes. And one of the first points that that book chapter makes is that there is no simple or single solution. And that reflects uh, what one of the leading um, scholars in this area said many years ago. Now, this is Eleanor Ostrom. Eleanor Ostrom was the first woman to win the Nobel Prize for Economics. She's a prominent scholar in commons theory. That means the sort of uh, resources that uh, can be uh, managed by collectives but uh, not accessed by everyone. And her work very much focused on identifying the kinds of rules I talked about earlier that are necessary for sustainable management of these resources. And she emphasised that there's no simple solution. There's no one solution that's going to work everywhere. And this isn't helped by the complexity of what governance looks like in real life. So I've given you some very sort of simple examples of um, community forest groups, of community conservancies, but in reality, these um, arrangements, these committees, these user groups operate within a broader landscape of governance. So this example here from uh, my work in um, Ghazi Bay in Kenya, shows a community forest association um, in the middle, Mikoko, and Mikoko Pomoja was a community-based organisation, or is a community-based organisation, um, in that uh, community forest association. Mikoko Pomoja means uh, mangroves together. And that um, association was formed to support the conservation of the mangrove forest through capturing and through accessing voluntary carbon credits. So through Plan Vivo, which um, accredits the, uh, the arrangements in, in Kenya, they're able to um, sell the, uh, the carbon capture by the mangrove forests in exchange for people who want to offset 
their very poor behaviour, such as flying, etc. So if you want to actually do that yourself and you want to support Mikoko Promoja, you can do that through the Association for Coastal Ecosystems, ACES, so look that up online. But anyway, getting back to the slide, uh, Mikoko Promoja then is not operating in isolation and none of these groups are. There's a village head and a village committee that they interact with, that there are other local groups, uh, the community-based uh, beach management units, for example, that work in fisheries. Um, they obviously interact a lot with the Kenya Forest Service, um, in, in, who in turn are part of the Ministry for Forestry and Wildlife. You know, inevitably, the um, Environment Agency has a, an impact on how the mangrove forests are governed. So, in essence, it's complicated. So when you're looking at um, whether those community-based structures are working or not, I often feel that's very unfair because they're part of a much more complicated system with lots of complex relationships. And so, um, you know, you have to look at the sort of bigger picture. And fortunately, I've, pro I've generated, I've developed a guide to help you do that. So I thought I'd better flag this up, make it look as though I've published something. Um, so I developed a guide from that research in, in Kenya on navigating multi-level natural resource governance that tries to help researchers and practitioners find their way through that complexity. So it provides a sort of list of questions and thinking and explanations for those factors and questions um, to sort of find their sort of, to navigate their way through that uh, multi-level, multi-sector, multi-actor um, governance landscape. Now, despite there being all those arrows in this diagram that I suggested, in, in reality, although there are all these actors that affect the coastal ecosystem, in that case, in the example in particular, mangrove forests, what you find in practice is that they operate very independently of each other, as I've suggested in this um, article that's just about to, to come out very soon. Um, they operate in silos, so very independently. So although these community-based groups have been set up, they've often been set up in a very sectoral way, which isn't in the spirit of the ecosystems within, within which they're supposed to be sort of managing. Um, because in reality, the mangrove forests, of course, it's important for timber, for um, coastal protection, but also as a nursery uh, for fish, a uh, breeding area for fish. So, you know, the, the interactions that take place in the ecosystem are not reflected in the governance systems that are set up to, to manage them. And so very often, these sort of silos of, of natural resource um, governance are not very helpful in, um, in, within that sort of um, complexity. It's actually very fragmented. Another reason why it's difficult for governance to um, actually deliver on these win-win outcomes is that people in practice adapt the rules. So I talked about Eleanor Ostrom um, coming up with a sort of ideal kinds of rules, rules that are necessary to um, successfully govern the commons. But in fact, actually what happens in practice, there are rules coming from many different sources. There are rules coming from the central government. There may be international global rules that affect what happens on the ground. There are local rules. There are rules beyond natural resource management that affect natural resource use. So I talked about kinship, for example, who you know, um, gender norms about, you know, it's very often within these communities, very different rules for what wim women and men can do, what sort of products they collect, etc. So people adapt the rules and what off happens very often is that they become quite hybrid and mixed and they change over time. So it's very difficult to know what will actually will work in practice. So again, I'm afraid it's rather complicated. And as I've said, in, uh, talked about in this um, second article that's on this um, slide, that um, this can be really important when we're thinking about governance arrangements, because very often there are gender norms and gender rules and expectations about how women behave, about how, how and whether they can speak in public places and whether they're listened to. So, you know, trying to create inclusive, fair, effective governance systems can be particularly challenging when we think about the, the wider gender norms and, and social norms that will influence them. And then finally then in this section, not quite finally yet, um, there is a lack of alternatives and a lack of incentives 
uh, for people in these circumstances. So I think that makes it very difficult to actually expect these governance arrangements to deliver on win-win outcomes. You might be a bit bewildered about why I've uh, included a photo of a uh, beehive there, but uh, that's because um, very often within um, these sort of projects that come in to try to improve the management of natural resources, they like to promote alternative livelihoods. And one of the alternative livelihoods they often promote is beekeeping. But I think there's a limit to how much honey and uh, beekeeping related projects that anyone could buy and it's not going to lead necessarily to huge employment or um, economic growth. And the second challenge then is uh, the, the scale of compensation uh, or financial incentives that people receive. I talked earlier about Makoko Pomoja and how they're tapping into the um, global carbon trading and benefiting from um, voluntary offsets uh, credits. Now, so the community uh, receives income from that and they make, it, make decisions as a community about how to spend that money. So here's uh, one example. You can see community water project funded by Makoko Pomoja, a borehole. But it's not enough. Very often that money is quite small scale. It's not really going to transform anyone's lives and make a real, real difference. So the scale of incentives it often doesn't match um, the need for change, if you like. Now, I would argue as well, that, so those sort of, um, uh, sort of findings I've had to date and um, I've found in the literature as well from other sources, but I would argue there are two additional reasons that have received less attention in the literature. The first one is that um, the political and economic, the wider political and economic context inevitably affects natural resource governance, which I will explain in a moment. And my second uh, argument is that I feel that although the separate power dynamics that we found, uh, that you'll find in all different parts of the sort of governance system, they haven't really been brought together and thought about how these cumulative power dynamics and power situations affect natural resource governance. So I'll explain these a little bit more now. So the wider political and economic context. Well, it might seem rather obvious that this is going to affect natural resource governance. But in, in um, reality, uh, we find that in a lot of the research into natural resource governance is really focused on the community-based structures or the collaborative arrangements themselves and hasn't really looked at what's going on in the wider political and economic um, situation that would affect how those governance arrangements work. So the example that I've given here is uh, from Lake Victoria. Um, and the three countries of, uh, the, the border the lake, uh, Kenya, Tanzania and Uganda, they're seen as um, democracies, but actually in reality the uh, space for opposition parties is rather limited. They're often described as competitive authoritarianism. They allow elections to um, authenticate authoritarian uh, behaviour. And... Um, often have a um, sort of patronage and this sort of patronage then of um, buying votes of uh, ensuring that your supporters will keep you in power is reflected in the fisheries system so particularly around election time local or even national politicians will be very uh, concerned about stopping any enforcement uh, by fisheries officers uh, they want they don't want to make sure their voters are not riled they're not being chased by the police and they're not uh, being arrested so there's interference in enforcement um, to the extent they'll sometimes um, get people out of out of uh, the police charge etc now the reason for including president Museveni of Uganda in this um, slide, that he has uh, significantly interfered with fisheries management. In the last presidential campaign in 2015, he accused the fisheries sector of widespread, widespread corruption, including the community-based beach management units. And he banned them. He stopped them after all my hard work, five years, creating, <laughs> helping to create the beach management units. He just stopped them overnight. And, um, you know, OK, he may not be wrong that there's uh, corruption within the fisheries management system, but it was rumoured that he did that because um, there was evidence that uh, the fisheries uh, communities were more likely to support opposition politicians, and he obviously didn't like that too much. Um, now, so going on to say a little bit more about corruption then, 
in research that I carried out in uh, sort of 2014 to 2016, we found that everyone, once we talked to, to them about fishing illegalities and what their experience had been with illegalities, they all talked about corruption. And of course, corruption doesn't happen just within fisheries. Within the broader context of these countries, this widespread corruption is uh, discussed in terms of people having to pay bribes to get access to services, to, uh, to prevent um, any sort of arrest by the police, etc. And so the same thing happens within fisheries, that uh, people will pay bribes to avoid arrest or to be allowed to carry on with um, fishing illegally. So by illegally, I mean using undersized nets, undersized hooks that will catch immature fish and contribute towards the unsustainable and overfishing of, of the lake. What does that mean then for co-management? Uh, well, I argue that um, this weak enforcement that results from that corruption um, leads to greater non-compliance. So, you know, what, what motivation have people got to comply if they can just buy their way out, if they can carry on fishing um, illegally? And I'd argue that this undermines the legitimacy and performance of co-management. And I particularly felt strongly about this because um, so there are some people on, on, uh, within East Africa who've argued that the, the beach management units are not working, co-management isn't working, we're still seeing um, illegalities, unsustainable fishing, etc. So perhaps we should give up with co-management. But no recognition, no talking about um, corruption, no recognition of um, the role that corruption plays in maintaining illegalities and undermining co-management. And then finally, I'd argue as well that um, the economic context inevitably affects the ability of co-management and other forms of collaborative natural resource management to deliver on these win-win outcomes. And that's because although within the countries that I've particularly worked in there has been good levels of growth, there's still a dependence on the agricultural sector. And there's still a lot of poverty and limited employment opportunities. So fisheries is still seen as a very attractive sector. It's a sector where you can go and get, make money quite quickly, as long as you can get access to gears or be employed by a boat owner. And you can get that money on a daily basis as long as you're going out fishing. So, you know, given that situation, it's very difficult then to know how you can uh, really improve things and, and deliver on a more sustainable fisheries management. And then coming on to these power dynamics that I mentioned, as I, as, as, um, I haven't said too much about power, but power is important in many of the different levels of government. And by power, I mean particularly in terms of who gets to make decisions about um, how resources are used, how revenue is generated, who gets to... Um, who gets to spend that money and at which levels and which bodies make decisions. So there's lots of different power dynamics going on, but they tend to be looked at separately within research and within practice and not really sort of brought together and understood, well, what does all this mean, these different sort of power dynamics together? So given all this situation, how can these elusive win-win outcomes be achieved? Well, I, I would argue that I certainly wouldn't give up hope. I'm a very optimistic person and I strongly believe in um, community-based and collaborative forms of management. But I think you do have to, we do have to bring in much more flexibility. We have to allow for different arrangements uh, between locations and over time and accept that those arrangements may look different as they uh, adapt and as they change over time. And allowing for that should encourage greater local ownership but we have to accept as well that that doesn't mean to say it's going to be cheap. Um, these sectors very often are competing with health, with education, um, for example, in, in trying to capture um, government budgets, and they often don't get an awful lot of budgetary support. Often it's very, only just about enough to pay um, salaries and perhaps office uh, management costs. So greater investment and support is needed for these management systems. But you also need to invest in relationships. So it's not just a technical matter, 
um, of getting the rules right, of getting the systems right. You have to sort of build up relationships between actors, particularly between the government and communities, um, so they can learn to, to work together in a much more effective way and build trust, etc. And then pay more attention then to the role of government and politics in these arrangements. An awful lot of attention has been given to communities about how they can be trained, about how their capacity can be built, how they can be empowered, but a lot less attention has been given to you know, what does it mean for the role of government, for the work of government officers, for their skills, for their jobs. Sometimes these government officers have felt threatened that they might lose um, power, that they might lose responsibility, etc. So those are some of the things that I would argue need greater attention. But you'll be pleased to know that I'm sort of coming towards the end of uh, my talk. But in case you, uh, you know, have whetted your appetite now and you want to know more, fortunately, I've just got a new book out. <laughs> it was published at the end of uh, 2019, very fortuitously. An edited book on uh, governing renewable natural resources. And what I tried to do in this book was really provide a sort of an introduction to the, to the topic and... Um, just look at all the different ways that you can analyse and all the different questions you can ask about uh, governing renewable natural resources. And at the very final chapter, I've tried to bring together, you know, what's really important, what, what have we learned from all these different approaches. And as you can see, I've even shared uh, the discount code with you there. Now, before I do finish, I felt like uh, the area that I haven't touched on, of course, is... Uh, you know, the effect of our decisions and our actions on people who, who depend on these renewable natural resources on a daily basis and for future generations. And I couldn't really resist advocating that we should all be doing something and uh, we all have a responsibility to, be, uh, to educate ourselves and remain educated about climate change in particular because, you know, I talked about the dependence that people have, the level of dependence people have on the natural resources, and they will be inordinately affected and already are by climate change. So I believe that we all here present in particular have a responsibility to remain educated and I've um, advertised here in particular the Met Office, very good resource for learning about climate change science and staying up to date and understanding the evidence. But the BBC is helping out again, they're doing very well at the moment and it's taken time I admit. Um, our planet matters so for the next year they're going to have a lot of programs including of course um, hopefully once David Attenborough gets out there we'll all be converted and changing our behavior but of course we should be campaigning as well so do look up the campaign against climate change and get involved and do what you can to raise awareness and offer leadership as well in the way that you behave and just in case I couldn't resist getting another book in there as well so just in case you want to know what climate change means for development I can recommend making climate compatible development happen right so thank you very much I just want to say a few thank yous actually before I do finish um, thank you of course for coming this evening and I uh, want to thank um, all of my family for making the effort and uh, for all the support um, over the years um, and my friends, I've got um, friends who've come up from Oxfordshire and uh, Jeanette's been very involved in helping me plan this lecture so thank you Jeanette um, and I just wanted to say a particular thanks to all my colleagues in IDD. I should be flicking up here. Uh, you might be, the, the, um, my IDD colleagues might be a bit surprised to see that first photo from the mid-1990s. And hopefully there's some of you will recognise yourselves there from 54 Pritchards Road. And some newer photos. That's not quite everyone in IDD, but it gives you a bit of a... Uh, a taste of who we all are so um, thank you very much um, everyone in IDD particularly Donald um, he was accredited uh, for appointing me all those years ago and uh, Richard Batley who's um, sat next to Donald who uh, was head of department for a long time in the 1990s and I should have thanked him for giving me the lectureship actually I think I should have I missed that out earlier and of course all of uh, my colleagues in IDD and Andrew Coulson, uh, my PhD supervisor who's here this evening. And then the bottom row, I've just got some, some of uh, photos of people I've worked with over the years. The first one that is, uh, now when I worked in Ginger, we were working at the, um, in the sort of spare sort of buildings of the National Fisheries uh, Research and Res Fisheries Resources and Research Institute. 
but now since they left they've got this spanking new headquarters so that's um, a group of us outside the Lake Victoria Fisheries Organisation headquarters in Ginger and who I still work with now in regular contact with them. The second photo along the bottom is in um, uh, well, on the, on the Kenyan coast, so that's uh, to do with that mangrove project and we were talking about multi-level governance at that workshop, so some colleagues there from the Kenya Marine and Fisheries Research Institute. And then finally, um, I've sort of more recently been working with the Nature Conservation Research Centre in Ghana and that's a few of us at that workshop working on that synthesis project of what we've learnt about governance. Over the years. So I'd like to thank all of the people I've worked with over the years and hopefully uh, will carry on working with and uh, anyone else I may work with in the future. And I will of course be working on trying to improve some of the solutions to these natural resource governance dilemmas. So I hope you'll um, keep an eye on my work and perhaps in some years to come I'll have some more solutions and some more good examples to share with you. Thank you very much. Hi, uh, <coughs> excuse me. I'm Rene Lindstedt. I'm the uh, head of the School of Government, uh, and I feel very honored to have been asked to deliver the closing remarks uh, of this wonderful event. Uh, I fully appreciate that at this point I'm the only thing between you and the refreshments outside, so I will keep it very short, I promise. Uh, to start with, I want to thank our uh, guest of honor, of course, Fiona Noonan, for an incredibly interesting and engaging uh, lecture. Um, your work really is a shining example of the kind of research that all of us aspire to do. It's cutting edge, it's topical, it's rigorous, interesting, and impactful. <coughs> Fiona's research, however, is just one of the many uh, qualities that make her an exemplary university citizen. Uh, we've heard a little bit about her many roles that she's taken on over the years in IDD, the School of Government, and the university more generally. Um, now, Fiona has certainly not hesitated to take on very challenging roles, but even more important, she has approached and fulfilled all these roles with passion, exceptional professionalism, and an ambition to always deliver results of the highest quality. Now, I've had the fortune of experiencing this firsthand through my first six months, relatively short time here at the University of Birmingham, first working with Fiona in her role as head of department of the International Development Department, and now as the School of Government's Head of Research. Uh, and I'm enormously grateful uh, to have Fiona as a colleague uh, and to be able to rely on her support and wise counsel. And uh, thank you all for joining us this evening. And uh, now let's celebrate uh, Fiona's many accomplishments by grabbing a drink out there. <laughs> thank you.